Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today in person and online. I'm Wendy Cutler, the Vice President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, and I run our DC office. Our institute is part of the broader Asia Society, and we focus on tackling policy challenges in the Indo-Pacific region and advancing solutions to these problems. We work with policymakers in the United States as well as throughout Asia to promote fresh thinking on critical and emerging matters. It is in this spirit we are just so delighted today to be able to welcome Janet Yellen, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury, to our stage. Secretary Yellen is a world-renowned economist, a widely cited academic, a consummate pub public servant, an inspirational leader, and I also hear she's great to work for and work with. As the only person in history to head the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Council of Economic Advisors, she has been a pioneer in her professional accomplishments and pursuits. And she heads the, the department at a time when Treasury's role could not be more important with respect to domestic and international challenges. Today, we are fortunate she's gonna share her insights and vision on the Biden administration's economic strategy in the Indo-Pacific region, the fastest growing and most dynamic region in the world. The Treasury Department in particular has played a key role in developing and implementing the Biden administration's economic agenda in this vital region. She and her colleagues have clearly heard the voices in the region that have pressed the United States to augment our security presence with a robust economic agenda. And under her leadership and in close collaboration with other agencies, we have witnessed stepped up engagement on the economic front through bilateral initiatives with allies and partners, through existing international and regional organizations like the G20 and APEC, as well as through new groupings like the Quad and IPEF. The Secretary's recent visit to China has helped stabilize our bilateral relationship and has reopened important channels of communication. But importantly, China has not been her sole focus. Her recent travels have taken her all over the region, including India, where I think she's made four trips in the past year, Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan, and Korea. And these visits have underscored the administration's commitment to promoting an affirmative economic agenda in the region, and not just one that is viewed through the prism of China. Now this month's gonna be a very busy month for US Indo-Pacific economic engagement with President Biden hosting APEC, with expected outcomes to be announced under IPEF, and through a possible I need to say the word possible still, Biden Xi, Biden Xi summit, but that looks more likely every day. But our regional economic engagement must not stop there. It will be important to build on these initiatives. And by doing so, we will leave no doubt in the minds of our regional allies and partners that the United States will continue to be an important and reliable financial, trade, investment, and supply chain partner as we promote an economic security agenda that takes their concerns and interests into account. So enough for me. I'm delighted to turn the podium over to Secretary Yellen, and please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that lovely introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Asia Society for hosting us today. Well, I'll start with the big picture. First, the United States began as an Atlantic nation, but we've long been a Pacific one as well. We see this clearly in California, 
where President Biden and I will head later this month to host the APEC Economic Leaders Week, and where I've spent much of my professional career. In California, as elsewhere across the country, our ties to Asia are evident. From the influence of the over half of California's immigrant population arriving in the past decade who were born in Asia, to the competition and collaboration with Asia driven by Silicon Valley over decades. Second, the Indo-Pacific region is at the center of the 21st century global economy. The region contains half of the world's population, and it's generating about two-thirds of global growth. I've seen this economic strength and dynamism firsthand as Treasury Secretary in my trips to India, Indonesia, South Korea, Vietnam, and across the region. Recognizing this big picture, the Biden administration is pursuing an approach to the Indo-Pacific that furthers our country's long history of engagement and does justice to the region's importance for our and the world's future. As President Biden laid out in his Indo-Pacific strategy, the United States is committed to an Indo-Pacific that is free and open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. The administration is working to tackle challenges and seize opportunities, including securing our supply chains and supporting America's workers. To spur growth, we're deepening economic integration and harnessing technological transformation. To build resilience, we're partnering across the region to address climate change and strengthen health systems. And in response to threats to human rights and international law, we're standing up to economic coercion and strengthening accountable democratic governance. Our economic ties underpin our approach to the Indo-Pacific. So in my remarks today, I'll highlight three priorities that are shaping an economic strategy in the region that is fit for this current moment. Increasing trade and investment, bolstering our economic resilience, and cooperating on global challenges. And I'll outline how we're advancing these priorities through strategic and intensifying multilateral and bilateral engagements. Growth and innovation in the United States help drive the dynamism in Indo-Pacific economies. While trade and investment between the US and Indo-Pacific benefit people across all our economies, including American communities and workers. As we look toward APEC later this month, let me state unequivocally, claims that America is turning away from the Indo-Pacific are wholly unfounded. We are deepening our economic ties across the region with tremendous potential benefits for the US economy and for the Indo-Pacific. First, the Biden administration is committed to expanding our trade and investment with Indo-Pacific countries. Trade between the United States and the Indo-Pacific region has steadily increased over the past decade, reaching $2.28 trillion in 2022. It's increased over 25% since just 2019, despite a pandemic dip. Indeed, trade in most sectors recovered to pre-pandemic levels by 2021 and then continued to grow. Trade in computers and electronic goods reached about $435 billion in 2022, including both significant imports and exports of electronics. That's the result of complex integrated supply chains. In total, across goods and services, the US exported 
about $770 billion to the region in 2022. That's almost one quarter of our global exports. And U.S. direct investment in the Indo-Pacific reached $866 billion in 2021. In parallel, the U.S. benefits from $956 billion in foreign direct investment from the Indo-Pacific. The economic case for our expanding trade and investment is clear. The Indo-Pacific is a dynamic and rapidly growing region. As it grows, we gain a fast expanding customer base for U.S. firms and workers. So trade boosts production at home to serve these export markets, enabling businesses to scale their operations and create more jobs. And jobs at export-oriented firms tend to pay more, helping generate solid, well-paying career options. For consumers, trade drives lower prices and increases choice. Of course, how we pursue greater economic integration with the Indo-Pacific also matters. We're focused on creating a level playing field for American workers, so the trade and investment with the Indo-Pacific continues adding to the several million American jobs it already supports. And we're pursuing economic integration while still protecting our national security interests through targeted actions where necessary. Looking ahead, increased trade and investment with the Indo-Pacific will continue to support more growth and more jobs at home, and it will fuel growth and employment in the Indo-Pacific as well. Second, we see economic engagement with the Indo-Pacific as crucial to bolstering our supply chain security. Our critical supply chains are too vulnerable to risks as the disruptions from COVID-19, the, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed. So along with massive investments at home through the president's economic agenda, we're pursuing an approach I've called friendshoring seeking to strengthen our economic resilience through diversifying our supply chains across a wide range of trusted allies and partners. Across the Indo-Pacific, the administration is pursuing multilateral engagements to better su coordinate supply chain efforts, from monitoring supply chain disruptions to responding to supply chain crises and we're making supply chains a focus of our bilateral engagements as well, such as with Vietnam. At home, greater supply chain resilience provides stability for consumers and helps ensure that our country's economic security is not unduly reliant on just one country for many critical inputs and achieving resilience through partnering with Indo-Pacific countries means gains for Indo-Pacific economies as well. We're starting to see the impacts in the data. Across sectors, from auto parts to electronics, the U.S. is importing more from key partners like India and Vietnam, as well as from Mexico, and is less dependent on one single country, in this case, China. As I've just noted, we're trading in substantial and rising amounts with the Indo-Pacific. So these shifts do not mean less trade, just a different pattern of flows of goods and services. We're generating diverse and secure supply chains, protecting our national security, and advancing our values while growing economies across the Indo-Pacific. Many firms are recognizing the benefits of multiple sources of inputs and production and diversifying too. And the shifts we're seeing also reflect other dynamics. 
it's natural that a richer country would less often serve as a base for final assembly. So China was always expected to see shifts in its export patterns as it grew richer, just as Japan did in the 1980s. Finally, as a third key priority, economic engagement with the Indo-Pacific is needed to address the urgent global challenges of our time. The Indo-Pacific region is highly vulnerable to climate change. A significant majority of the region's populations is dependent on the oceans, and Pacific islands face the increasingly likely possibility of losing land due to sea level rise, with severe potential consequences for their people and their economies. The interconnectedness of our economies and our shared goal of a viable future on this planet leaves us no choice but to support Indo-Pacific countries in addressing these challenges and realizing the opportunities of the energy transition. Looking forward, we will build on what we've accomplished so far and continue advancing our priorities, including through strong multilateral engagements with Indo-Pacific countries. I'll highlight just a few examples. Be to begin with, President Biden has continued to strengthen collaboration with Australia, India, and Japan through the Quad. Consistent with the key priorities I've outlined, the Quad is increasing cooperation across our export credit agencies and linking executives and investors to foster co-investment in critical technologies. It's identifying ad and addressing gaps in key supply chains for the clean energy minerals and technology we need to bolster our resilience. And it's providing technical assistance to address climate vulnerabilities. We're seeing significant benefits for our economies and for the Indo-Pacific. Collaboration with the Quad complements our work through other multilateral groups, from ASEAN to the Pacific Islands Forum. The United States, of course, also plays a very active role in APEC, and we're proud to be serving as its host this year. And in May 2022, we launched the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPEF, with 13 other countries. Together, we account for 40% of global GDP and 28% of global trade in goods and services. And we're writing new rules for the 21st century economy, from trade to tax to supply chains to clean energy. Last May, IPEF members concluded a landmark supply chain agreement that will provide a framework for deepened collaboration and coordination, including through new commitments on information exchange, regulatory transparency, collective response to disruptions, and upskilling and reskilling workers. The agreement aims to support Indo Pacific economies while facilitating a reliable supply of critical goods so that American companies and workers have the key inputs they need to operate without disruptions. The agreement also advances our values, such as through setting up new mechanisms to ensure respect for labor rights. And we're also pursuing multilateral efforts with the Pacific Islands to address global challenges. President Biden welcomed Pacific Island leaders to Washington for a summit in 2022. And I was glad to be able to join for a second summit this year. We're collaborating with the Pacific Islands on ways to strengthen economic resilience against threats to macro financial stability including climate change, 
such as through our efforts to increase the scale, speed, and effectiveness of climate finance and our call to evolve the multilateral development banks. Our multilateral engagements are just the start. We're also advancing our key priorities through extensive bilateral engagements. I'll begin with our approach to Asia's largest economy, the People's Republic of China. We know the US-China relationships is among the most consequential in the world, and we need to get it right for Americans and for people around the world, including across the Indo-Pacific. That begins with a serious, clear-eyed economic approach. As I've said, the United States does not seek to decouple from China. A full separation of our economies or an approach in which countries, including those in the Indo-Pacific, are forced to take sides would have significant negative global repercussions. We have no interest in such a divided world and its disastrous effects. And given the extent of economic linkages within the Indo-Pacific region and the complexity of global supply chains, it's also simply not practical. Instead, we are de-risking and diversifying by investing at home and strengthening linkages with allies and partners around the world. We've put forth a vision of the world grounded in values we share with these allies and partners and in which there is also a healthy and stable economic relationship between the United States and China. To advance this vision, our economic approach in China will continue to center on three main goals. First, we're securing our national security interests and advancing human rights. These are areas where we do not compromise. But when we take national security actions using economic tools, we do so in narrowly targeted ways such as with President Biden's executive order on outbound investments aimed at accomplishing our national security goals and not choking off growth in China. Second, we're seeking a healthy economic relationship that benefits both sides. This means responding appropriately to China's unfair economic practices such as non-market policies that disadvantage American firms and workers, the barriers it imposes to market access, and its use of economic power to coerce vulnerable trading partners. Third, we're working to collaborate on the global challenges of our time, from climate change to debt distress in low-income countries. Successfully pursuing these goals depends on deep and durable communication with our Chinese counterparts to prevent misunderstanding and clarify our areas of agreement and disagreement. In July, I visited Beijing to meet China's new economic team. The visit led to the launch of economic and financial working groups which provide ongoing channels to discuss macroeconomic and financial policies, work towards specific goals, and ultimately put our relationship on a surer footing. Each working group recently met for the first time. But of course, advancing America's priorities in the Indo-Pacific requires much more than a China strategy. Across the Indo-Pacific, we are rebuilding and, in, and strengthening older alliances and investing in newer partnerships. And I'll address just a few of our partnerships with countries I visited during my time as Treasury Secretary. With South Korea, which I visited in July 2022, 
and Japan, which I visited then and then again last May, the Biden administration is pursuing collective efforts to bolster the resilience of our respective supply chains. Our partnership was strengthened by the inaugural Trilateral Leaders Summit this past August, and we look forward to holding the first Trilateral Finance Ministers meeting in the coming year. We're also advancing our priorities through our bilateral relationship with Vietnam, which I visited last July. Since then, U.S.-Vietnam relations have been upgraded to a comprehensive strategic partnership. And it's an especially promising moment for the U.S.-Vietnam economic relationship Trade with Vietnam has grown at an annual rate of nearly 25% over the past almost three decades, reaching over $140 billion in 2022. Vietnam also plays a growing role in the global semiconductor supply chain. This is exactly the opportunity our friendshoring approach positions us to act on. We can bolster American supply chain resilience while advancing common values and growing ours and our partners' economies. In addition to its far-reaching domestic investments, the CHIPS Act created a $500 million fund for international investments. In September, President Biden launched a landmark semiconductor partnership with Vietnam. We're incentivizing American companies to invest in Vietnam. From Amcor Technologies' launch of a test and assembly plant last month, to plans by Synopsys and Marvell for new semiconductor design centers. And we're pairing financing with more holistic support, such as workforce development initiatives in collaboration with the government of Vietnam and the private sector. This will support workers in Vietnam, and it will help create good jobs for Americans elsewhere along the semiconductor industry value chain. Our economic partnership with Vietnam also extends to addressing global challenges. Leaders from Vietnam and the International Partners Group, including the U.S., announced a Just Energy Transition Partnership, or JETP, in December 2022. This partnership will support Vietnam in delivering on its ambitious targets to transition away from fossil fuels to clean energy. Vietnam is actively working on the first step of JETP implementation with the development of a resource mobilization plan and we look forward to marking meaningful progress at the upcoming COP. I'll end with India, the world's largest democracy, where I've personally traveled four times in less than one year, including for our annual India-US Economic and Financial Partnership, or EFP. The United States is India's largest trading partner, our bilateral trade exceeded $190 billion in 2022. Our goods exports grew by almost 20% between 2021 and 2022, and our service exports by 40%. We're working to build supply chain resilience. We launched an initiative on critical and emerging technology on which we're also pursuing dialogue with Singapore. The U.S. and India are also collaborating on key challenges. During its G20 presidency, India helped advance our call to evolve the multilateral development banks, and we pursued joint work aimed at alleviating debt distress among vulnerable low-income and emerging market countries. Looking ahead, we will continue to further collaboration 
including through planning to host India for the next round of EFP meetings in early 2024. Well, let me conclude by returning to the big picture. The United States has long been a Pacific nation, and it's abundantly clear we remain one today. The Indo-Pacific is at the center of the 21st century global economy, and growth and innovation in the United States, paired with our engagement in the region, is helping realize its tremendous potential. From the Quad to IPEF, from Vietnam to India, we're increasing trade and investment, bolstering our supply chains, and addressing global challenges. And at APEC later this month, and far beyond it, we will only continue to expand and deepen our engagement. Jobs and security at home in the United States, the growth and resilience of Indo-Pacific economies, and the strength of our global economy depends on it. Thank you so much again for having me here today. And with that, um, the program is over. We're so glad you could join us this afternoon to hear Secretary Yellen's insightful and important comments. Her speech provided a clear sense of how the United States is currently and is going to continue to engage economically in this important region. You all don't have to leave right away. If you want to hang out a bit, we have some coffee available. And we also have staff available to talk about some of the projects that the Asia Society Policy Institute is working on. But now as we conclude today's, today's gathering, on behalf of the Institute, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you for coming out today in person and for those who are watching it online. Thank you very much. Thank you.